الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإنه لكتاب عزيز لا يأتيه الباطل من بين يديه ولا من خلفه تنزيل من حكيم حميد وقال الله تبارك وتعالى فقرأوا ما تيسر من القرآن وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن هذا القرآن أنزل على سبعة أحرف فقرأوا ما تيسر منه وقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن هذا القرآن أنزل على سبعة أحرف كلها شاف كاف أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام الحمد لله it's a, it's a great uh, نعمة and blessing from الله سبحانه وتعالى that he's given me the opportunity to speak about this very noble science um, any science, any subject to do with the kalam of Allah is extremely noble and not, it, it is something that we are not worthy of uh, and it is only through the, the mercy and the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to uh, engage with these subjects and with these topics and with these sciences it is something to celebrate so alhamdulillah I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I think uh, my friends, Sheikh Hudayfa, and my friends at Siblings of Ilm, uh, for putting this together. Uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, to get started, uh, this will just be a brief introduction to the science of Qiraat. So I took a quick glance at the participants today, mashallah, some, some names I recognize, uh, some scholars, some academics even. And so, uh, for some of you, I know that a lot of these things will be very basic, uh, but I th the intended audience for this are uh, individuals who uh, are advanced students of Tajweed and would like to study uh, the Qira'at tradition, or students who are studying the Qira'at tradition or are about to, or who have, but would like more insight in the subject. Um, and there are certain points, like every science, like every science, there are certain points that are points of controversy and uh, points of debate. And uh, there are also certain points that are uh, sometimes not easy to swallow um, or difficult to understand. Um, and so I'm going to try my best to avoid uh, getting into the nitty-gritty of the controversial points and I will gloss over certain things uh, but due to time restrictions I won't be able to get uh, into everything um, but for those who are more academic minded I'm sure that they're more aware of the things that I'll be talking about anyway. Khair, to get started, uh, the objectives I have listed here, uh, some of the main ones are uh, a brief understanding, just a very brief understanding of the historical development of the Qira'at from the Ahruf. So what are the Ahruf and what are the Qira'at? Um, and how one leads to the other. Uh, and the sense of, and the methodology uh, that the Qura used in order to get to what we have today, the 10 Qira'at. Uh, and then, because this is kind of catered towards students of the tradition, um, I will discuss how the Shatibiyya and the Durra, which are the two main texts of this science uh, in the tradition today, how they are read, how they deciphered, and how uh, teachers teach these to their students. So be, uh, one of the object objectives of this course is to become a little more familiar with Qira'at, pedagogy, uh, how it is taught, uh, the, didact the didactic methods uh, with which it is taught. So to begin with the Ahruf, uh, I have a hadith here 
عن ابن عباس رضي الله عنهما أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أقرأني جبريل على حرف فلم أزل أستزيده حتى انتهى إلى سبعة أحرف that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said that Jibreel recited to me in a single harf and I continued asking him to increase it until it reached seven ahruf. There are many different variations of this hadith. Some, uh, some variations mention that uh, Mikail is present and convincing the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to increase. Some variations mention uh, the Prophet Sallallahu explaining why he wants it increased. And it goes into more detail that it will be difficult, it will be difficult for my ummah to recite in just one singular harf uh, because there are elderly, there are people who are not uh, able to uh, recite uh, in a dialect that they're not familiar with, etc., etc. So Jibreel Alayhi Salam, he comes back with and he says Allah has allowed you to recite in two harfs and the Prophet وسلم, he asks again and three harfs and then it jumps to seven Sabatu Ahruf. The question is uh, what exactly are the Ahruf? So a little more context from another hadith. It is reported this is a famous hadith of Umar ibn al Khattab radiallahu anhu uh, a story that occurs with him, that he, he, he hears Hisham ibn Hakim reciting Surah Al-Furqan. This was during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He listens to his recitation and he found that it was different than what uh, he, Yani Umar radiallahu anhu was taught. And he became upset and he was about to stop him immediately, but he waited until Hisham radiallahu anhu uh, completed his salah. Then he confronted him and he asked him, who taught you this, this surah? So he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught me. And Umar radiallahu anhu becomes upset. He said, you've lied because he, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also taught this surah to me uh, in a manner differently than what you're reciting. So he took him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and uh, he he complained to the Prophet Sallallahu So the Prophet Sallallahu he calms him down and he asks Hisham to recite. And then the Prophet Sallallahu he says, it was, it was revealed like this. Then he asks Umar Anhu to recite and Umar Anhu recites in the manner that he was taught. And uh, the Prophet Sallallahu again says, this Qur'an was revealed in seven ahruf. Recite whichever is easiest for you. Okay, so many scholars of the tradition, they, they deduce from this hadith that the Prophet wasallam taught the Sahaba uh, in various readings. Some scholars, they deduce from this that the Prophet wasallam taught certain surahs or certain verses in different manners during different times to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So, what exactly are the ahruf? What differentiates one harf from another harf? Okay, so uh, there are many theories. Many theories uh, regarding what the ahruf are. Some say they are to do with the tribes and dialects. Some say that they're to do with subjects uh, uh, that are mentioned or discussed in the Quran. Some divide them into categories of, of differences, um, differences of actual words and phrases. Uh, so the story of Umar and Hisham, uh, anhuma. So some scholars, uh, they have, they dug deeper into the differences using what's known as the shawad qira'at, the non-canonical qira'at that, are, that we still have reports of to deduce what those differences were. And, they, and we find that they were differences, probably differences of actual words and phrases and not differences of dialects uh, specifically, especially in the story of Umar and Hisham because they're both from the same tribe and they speak the same dialect. Yet, they both have 
differences in the beginning of Surah Al-Furqan. So what we what we find from this is that it, there were differences of actual words and phrases. Um, and so you have a lot of discussion uh, you, uh, from the ulama about what exactly these differences are. And so some ulama will say uh, you, have, you have weaker opinions, you have stronger opinions, you have some in the middle, uh, people on the fence. Some say that these seven are the different dialects seven different dialects, those of uh, that of the Quraysh and Hudayl and Tamim, Rabi'a and Hawazin, etc., etc., Kanana, Qais, etc. Um, so some say that. Uh, and some say, rather, it's uh, to do with, uh, I'll get to that in a bit. And some say, uh, then you find that some fuqaha will say that Oh, they're to do with the different fiqh subjects in the Quran, and then the the Ahlul Tasawwuf will say, "Oh, they're to do with, with the different subjects of Tasawwuf." So these are weaker opinions um, that are kind of projected onto this Hadith. Um, and then Ibn al Jazari, Imam Ibn al Jazari, rahimahullah, uh, who we will talk about uh, in more detail later, but he goes into uh, what he thinks is. Uh, his or, or his take, his interpretation, and that is that he says that I he, he says that I investigated the qiraat, the authentic ones and the inauthentic ones, the the shadh and the sahih, and the weak ones and the rejected ones, and what became clear to me is that there are seven categories, and this is his opinion that there are seven categories of differences among all of these. Um, and he's, he's very decisive and he says that I found no difference uh, that is excluded from one of these seven categories. And the, the rough summary is um, that the harakat differ without uh, any change in meaning. For example, uh, yahsabu versus yahsibu. Um, that's one of the, that's, that falls under that category. Bilbukhl. Bilbukhul, bilbakhl. The meaning doesn't change, but the harakat and the pronunciation, the accents will change. Uh, the second that he mentions is that there is an ikhtilaf of the harakah, uh, and it does change the meaning a little bit. It does change uh, the meaning, and only the meaning. So just a difference of the harakah, but not the accent or anything. So an example of that, fatalaqa. Adamu mir rabbihi kalimatin versus fatalaqa Adam mir rabbihi kalimatun. Um, and the other example that he mentions, wa dhakara ba'da ummatin versus ba'da amatin, which is under the shadha. The third one he mentions is uh, that the letters will will change among the qira, uh, among the ahruf. The letters will change um, and the meaning will change as well. So Tablu, for example, will turn into Tatlu. Nunajika will turn into Nunahika, um, uh, which falls under the Shawad again. Uh, the fourth one that he mentions is the the اختلاف um, الحروف بتغير الصورة فقط. The meaning doesn't change, but the letter changes. An example of that is الصراط versus الصراط with the سين. Basta versus Basta. Uh, another one that he mentions, the fifth one, is that the letters will change and both the, the surah, the appearance, the actual physical letter will change and the meaning will change, uh, such as Fasa'u ila dhikrillah versus Famdaw ila dhikrillah, which is again in the Shawad. It's not in the canonical readings, but he's talking about the Ahruf. The sixth one he talks about is at taqdim wa taqhir, such as fayaktuluna wa yuktalun, could also would also be read by others as fayuktaluna wa yaktulun, wajat sakratul haqi bil maut, as opposed to wajat sakratul mauti bil haq. So that is also something that is found in the reports. Um, 
if I remember correctly, another one, إِذَا جَاءَ إِذَا جَاءَ فَتْحُ اللَّهِ وَالنَّصْرِ is another example of that. So these all fall under the shawadh. Uh, and then the last one he mentions is الزِيَادَةُ وَالنُقْصَانِ uh, that, such, that uh, there are certain additions or subtractions of either letters or words or, or substitutions. وَأَوْصَى versus وَوَصَى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى versus the famous وَالذَّكَرِ وَالْأُنْثَى uh, that's attributed to Ibn Mas'ud and other Sahaba. So that's Ibn al uh his take on what the differences of the Ahruf are. Uh, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's an open debate. It is not uh, something uh, that is very clear. But the majority, the majority of scholars feel that it has to do with the differences of words and the summary of what Ibn al-Jazari mentioned, whether there are exactly seven categories or not, that's the next point. That does Sabah Ahruf mean literal seven or rhetorical seven? So you'll find that the Jumhur, the majority of scholars, they will say that the, the number Sabah in the Hadith is literal although the exact meaning or the exact distinction, uh, distinction between these seven, uh, that's ambiguous. But they maintain that the number seven is literal due to the fact that the number seven is consistently mentioned. Uh, others will say that rather it is the seven, the sabra of balagha, the rhetorical seven, the, the, the symbolic seven, that refers to a large number. Because in the Arabic language uh, and in Balagha and Arabic rhetoric, uh, seven and uh, derivatives of seven, seventy, seven hundred, seventy thousand, etc., they are used to uh, signify large numbers. And it happens in the Quran as well. And so some scholars maintain, uh, albeit a minority, but some scholars maintain that it is actually a rhetorical seven that just refers to uh, kathra, um, just a larger number, uh, implying flexibility. Uh, and this, this uh, opinion is attributed by some to Ali and Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhumah to Qadi Ayyad and uh, a contemporary scholar, Dr. Ghanim Qaduri, hafizahullah. So what is the purpose of the ahruf exactly? Uh, from the from a traditional stance, that why are there ahruf? Why is there flexibility earlier on? And so this is also a large point of discussion. That and the the main explanation comes from the hadith itself, which is that it would have been quite difficult to uh, for the the Arabs and the Muslims at the time to you recite everything, uh, to recite just the same uh, text all at once. It would have been difficult for them, especially if they were not familiar with some of the vocabulary. And the, the main priority at the time, and during this 23-year uh, period of revelation, was for the people to understand the message and to absorb the message and to build their iman. And so this flexibility allowed, uh, allowed for the ease of the ummah to kin- continue reciting and understanding. And it added nuance. Scholars say that it added nuance to the meaning of the Qur'an and the message of the Qur'an. And it contributes to the tafsir. It contributes to the tafsir. And as for whether... Uh, all of these ahruf continued or persisted after uh, the time of the Prophet ﷺ, or whether they were meant to persist after the time of the Prophet ﷺ, that is up for debate, uh, and we'll get to that in a second. It is important to note, though, that for the, 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 the accepted recitations and the accepted readings and the authentic readings, uh, we don't really find any contradictions 
between one or the other in the sense that it would uh, make the message of the Qur'an problematic, uh, but rather they simply add nuance to one another. It's a lengthier discussion than that, but that's a rough summary. So how did the ahruf develop into the qira'at? To talk about that, we have to first talk about the standardization of the single uh, mus'haf. So during the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu, this is where the main uh, standardization or the the most important standardization happens. But from reports, we know that the first compilation project took place during the, khil- the Khilafah of Abu Bakr anhu, where there was a battle and many Qurra were killed, many teachers of the Qur'an and scholars of the Qur'an were killed, and Umar anhu expressed uh, worry that because they were expanding their empire and, the, and they were uh, the Islamic w- world and the Islamic community was growing and they were, there were people going on expeditions, they didn't want to risk uh, the loss of uh, any valuable information. And in addition, I would add that another reason to, to compile the Qur'an uh, was for... To, to accelerate the learning process for a lot of people. Because it's much easier to learn when you have a physical, tangible thing in front of you. And so Umar anhu expressed that he wanted to compile the Qur'an uh, in one single compilation. And the story is famous, I won't get into it, but Abu Bakr anhu resisted, um, but then he says that Allah placed... Uh, placed it in my heart and, and uh, helped me understand. And then we went to Zayd, Zayd ibn Thabit anhu, uh, and asked him to head the project. So they asked Zayd ibn Thabit anhu. He also resisted, uh, but then he also gradually understood. And the first project uh, was not necessarily a standardization project but rather a collection project. They just wanted to collect uh, all of the verses and place them in a particular order, um, regardless of the wording or the, the, the phrasing of it or the dialect of it even. They weren't concerned about a lot of the things that they were concerned about during the second project, during the time of Uthman radiallahu anhu. So during the first project, um, the, they had a set of principles that are mentioned in the reports where Zayd radiallahu anhu says that they would try to track down a written, uh, a written uh, copy or manuscript of each verse and then two witnesses for each verse as well. And so, uh, and he mentions how difficult this was for them uh, and so on and so forth. But eventually they complete it. During the time of Umar radiallahu anhu, uh, nothing really happens uh, with the manuscripts themselves, but the Islamic world is growing. Uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, he appoints uh, certain sahaba to various cities to teach them Qur'an. He appoints Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu to Kufa to teach them Qur'an. And the Sahaba at this time, they, are recite, they have a lot of variance among themselves in the recitation of the Qur'an. Um, and these reports, uh, the, the reports are, are plentiful, and we can see some of the variance that they had among themselves. Uh, but more or less, they were left alone. During the time of Uthman, uh, there's the people, uh, the laity started arguing among themselves uh, regarding the Qur'an. Uh, The reports indicate that people had begun to argue about whose reading was superior to to whose reading. Uh, So uh, someone someone would say, for example, oh, the the reading of Ibn Mas'ud is superior to to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari or his is superior to Ubay ibn Ka'ab, etc., etc., so some Sahaba became very concerned about this because of a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, 
in which uh, he indicates that uh, disagreeing or debating over the Qur'an is tantamount to kufr. And so Huzaifa ibn al-Yaman radiyallahu anhu in particular becomes very concerned and we find reports that he visits Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu, he visits uh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiyallahu anhu and he expresses an idea that what if we kind of merged your two recitations together uh, and that was something uh, that Ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu uh, he expressed a lot of dislike towards that idea. He was not a fan of that idea. Um, but Hudayfa radiyallahu anhu was concerned, uh, his concern uh, was overbearing and he eventually went to Uthman radiyallahu anhu and he expressed this idea and he expressed his concern uh, that the people have begun to argue over the Quran. Uh, perhaps it is better if we make a standardized version a standardized mushaf for the ummah to follow. So, Uthman who agreed. He called upon Zayd ibn Thabit once again. And they had a shura of sahaba uh, and a project. And he called Zayd uh, عنه, once again to head it. Some reports indicate that the reason that he called Zayd عنه, is because... Uh, uh, the precedent was already set by Abu Bakr and Umar before him. So they started this project of making a universalized, a standardized uh, mushaf for the ummah to follow. Okay. Now, there is a lot of debate as to what extent they intended to restrict the variations um, uh, among the ummah. There's a lot of debate upon, uh, on that point. Um, but for the most part, we can see that they left it open enough, ambiguous enough, at least to to allow and to accommodate for the qiraat that we have today, more than the qiraat that we have today. But at the very least, the qiraat that we have today, they all fall under uh, this mushaf of Uthman radiallahu anhu, the canonized, the the canonical qiraat fall. Uh, they all uh, followed the Mus'haf of Uthman radiallahu anhu that was compiled during his Khilafah. Okay, so the Rasm in particular, the orthography, the skeletal form, that remains more or less consistent. The goals and the methods of this project were to unify the Ummah upon one text of the Qur'an for everyone to read. Whether or not they anticipated all of the qiraat that would have been that could be accommodated by this mushaf uh, is up for debate. Allahu a'lam. But at the very least, they did intend for a certain level of standardization, and they sent they made copies of mushafs, um, uh, and they sent them to various cities. How many is uh, uh, there is uh, disagreed upon, uh, but uh, Kufa Basra. Sham, Mecca, uh, some say that Uthman who kept one for himself as well. Um, and among these Musahif, there are also minor variations, which uh, the scholars of the tradition will say that they are the reason of those variants are to accommodate for the multiple variants that were reported from the Prophet. The concern of Ibn Mas'ud عنه, when it, this order reached Kufa, that Uthman عنه, is standardizing the Mus'haf, in my opinion, so we have reports of Ibn Mas'ud عنه, becoming extremely uh, upset because the order is that Uthman عنه, has commanded everyone, now the Khalif has commanded everyone to recite according to this Mus'haf and all other masahif should should be disposed of, should be burnt. Because burning is the way to dispose of masahif. So they should be disposed of, they should be burnt. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu protests this. Um, Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu feels, in my opinion, he is not protesting the standardization. He does not mind uh, how people are reciting, but rather he does not want... Uh, 
he does not want the elimination of variance to occur. That's what he's worried about. And so that's why he protests and he, and he tells his people, he tells his students in Kufa, uh, first he expresses his authority that the Prophet Sallallahu and it, there's no doubt that Ibn Mas'ud Radiallahu Anhu is one of the most authoritative Sahaba when it comes to the Qur'an. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a narration, uh, he, he hears the recitation of Ibn Mas'ud Radiallahu Anhu and he says to his companions, مَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ يَقْرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ غَضًّا كَمَا أُنزِلْ فَلْيَقْرَأَ قِرَاءَةَ بْنِ أُمِّ عَبْدٍ That whoever wishes to recite uh, the Qur'an in, a manner, in an, an adulterated manner, uh, as if it was re- the way it was revealed, then let them recite in the reading of Ibn Mas'ud. Um, and another narration, the Prophet ﷺ mentions that اِسْتَقْرَأُ uh, الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ أَرْبَعَةٍ That learn the recitation of the Qur'an from four. And among them he mentions, the first one he mentions, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. Right? And the others are Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Salim Mawla Abi Hudayfa, Mu'ad ibn Jabal, radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. So there's no doubt about the authority of Ibn Mas'ud, radiyallahu anhu, but, but uh, his concern is that he does not want his, uh, his reading and his teachings to become eliminated and lost and erased in history. And so he, he advises his people, he advises his students to hold on to their masahif uh, and to not burn them and to not get rid, get rid of them and to keep on reciting from them. Um, Ibn Mas'ud, anhu, he had an intimate relationship with the Prophet wasallam. He learned uh, much of the Qur'an with the Prophet wasallam. He does not want to abandon that which he took directly from the Prophet wasallam. So one might say, well, what is the reasoning behind the standardization of Uthman? Isn't Ibn Mas'ud correct in that regard? Well, the bulk of the Sahaba at the time, especially in Medina, they felt that the disagreements of the, of the people regarding the Qur'an were serious enough. They were serious enough that standardization was needed. That a standardization was needed. And so you see that uh, the majority of the ummah kind of gets on board. The people of Basra, the people of Sham, the people of Mecca, they get on board with uh, the Rasam of Uthman radiallahu anhu. And gradually, uh, there, we find that there an, an ijma'ah takes place among uh, not just Qurra, but theologians and jurists, fuqaha, on the Mus'haf and the Rasm of Uthman radiallahu anhu. All those Masahif, as long as a reading corresponds to one of those Masahif, uh, then it is correct and it is, uh, it is uh, allowed to be recited. Otherwise, it is considered Shad. So this ijma' gradually takes place. And so it takes, it takes a little longer in Kufa, I'll get to that uh, a little later, but it does take a little longer in Kufa due to the, the resistance of Ibn Mas'ud. Uh, but no one really has a problem. Uh, no, the majority of people don't really have a problem with the standardization taking place. So, is there a theological problem with it? So, the... The oral, the we'll talk about the early development of the Qiraat. This is before Ibn Mujahid. So we see that the oral tradition works alongside the Rasm tradition. Okay, and that is to say that uh, the question arises, the Ishkal arises, that weren't many readings lost due to the standardization of the Mus'haf of Uthman? And the answer to that is perhaps some some were lost, but we do have reports of a lot of the shawath. We do have a lot of the reports. And we have enough for a good amount of diversity. And those shawath qira'at, those, those non-canonical recitations, they are still used in other matters of, of deen. The fuqaha use them. Muhaddithun um, will use them uh, to derive rulings. Mufassirun will use them. So what happens to the oral tradition as a result of the standardization of the rasm? 
Well, it kind of adapts. Uh, we have a quote, this is attributed to Umar radiallahu anhu, that al-qira'atu al-Qur'an, sunnatun muttaba'a, the reading of the Qur'an, the recitation of the Qur'an, is a followed sunnah. The successors, ya'khuduha al-awwal, ya'khuduha al-akhir, a'in al-awwal, the successors transmit it from the early generations. So it's it's a talaqi. And talaqi is very important in our tradition. وَإِنَّكَ لَتُلَقَّ الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ لَدُنْ حَكِيمٍ عَلِيمٍ right? Talaqi is how the Qur'an, that we believe that the Qur'an was received by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from uh, Jibreel Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And let me just make sure that you all can hear me. Uh, yes, feel free to ask questions in the chat and then I'll get to them after uh, at the very end, inshallah. So, talaqi, the, the receiving of the Qur'an, uh, the oral tradition is very important, is very important in our tradition. And so what happens is that there's a need to adapt to the Mus'haf of Uthman, radiallahu anhu. Now, According to reports, the Mus'haf of Uthman radiallahu anhu, it allows for a lot of readings. Uh, it accommodates a lot of different readings because there aren't, from, from what we have in reports, there aren't necessarily, or I'll, I'll say it like this, the harakat and the, and the nuqt, the dots of the letters, they aren't considered a part of the rasm, as well as hamza. Right? So the, the hamza that we see, the symbol for the hamza and the harakat and the dots, they're not considered a part of the rasm. Right? Now, some say that the early, the early manuscripts did not have any dots or any, any harakat at all. Um, that's a debated point. We do have a lot of ancient manuscripts. We see a lot of ancient manuscripts that do have, that do show harakat and things like that. But uh, there's so much diversity that we see that they aren't considered a part of the rasm. There is accommodation to kind of uh, change those around. And so that's how the different qira'at get accommodated in the single, the single uh, rasm, in the single standardized mushaf. So now these oral traditions um, they kind of originate, some of them will originate separately from the Rasm of Uthman, from the Rasm Uthmaniya. So how is it, uh, is it allowed to kind of recite one harf because they're originating from one harf or different harfs? Is it allowed to recite from one harf and mix it with another harf from these Sabra Ahruf? Um, is it allowed to take different portions of the Qur'an from different people? And that turns out to be the case that no one has a problem with this. Um, so a common misconception among people who haven't studied Qira'at or who haven't really taken a look at the science, the scholars of the science don't have this mis misconception, but those who haven't studied, they'll often articulate this incorrect point that, for example, the riwayah of Hafs an Asim, this is a reading from cover to cover. This is one of the ways the Prophet ﷺ definitely recited from cover to cover. Uh, that is incorrect. We cannot say that for certain. Um, it is very unlikely to say that, that from cover to cover, from, from Fatiha to Nas, that exactly in the way that's transmitted from Imam Hafs, from the re reading of Imam Asim, cover to cover, that's exactly the Prophet Sallallahu one Ramadan, he recited it exactly that way. Um, no. But rather, each verse should be look to, uh, taken individually, looked at individually, and then we can say uh, that uh, our scholars say that according to our faith, that each verse comes, uh, uh, has a sanad back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the concept of taking from different sources and developing a qira'ah, this is known as ikhtiyar. ikhtiyar. And this was a practice 
that was practiced by these early Qurra, uh, including the canonical, the, the canonical Qurra. So Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, there's a narration attributed to him. لَيْسَ الْخَطَأُ أَنْ يَقْرَأَ or أَنْ يُقْرَأَ بَعْضُهُ فِي بَعْضُ وَلَكِنَّ الْخَطَأَ أَنْ يُلْحَقَ بِهِ مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهِ Okay, ma qal, if I remember that correctly, but there is no error. There, the mistake, the error is not in reciting part of one harf with another. Meaning, uh, there is no issue with, there's theoretically no issue with reciting different uh, transmissions. For example, uh, something that you get from Ibn Masrud with, with, with another verse that you get from Umar ibn al-Khattab for example. The error, the mistake is adding to the Qur'an that which is not from it, that which has not been revealed, that which has not been transmitted, uh, according to scholars, that which has not been tra been transmitted, that is not something that is allowed. Okay, So this is where the concept of ikhtiyar comes into play. Ikhtiyar means that the early Qurra, they had many teachers, many traditions. Uh, they heard many different ways for certain verses and many different ways and, and dialects of reciting the Qur'an. And so they would, according to their judgments, uh, develop uh, this sort of recitation that they felt to be the most asah, or the most correct, or the most proper, or the most eloquent. And... This is a vast subject, which I don't have time to get into, uh, but there are books on uh, usul al-ikhtiyar, how the early Qurra practiced ikhtiyar, right? Whether, for example, one, one reason to do ikhtiyar of one wajh, one transmission over another, you have in Surah Nazi'at. Um, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ وَاجِفَةِ أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعَةِ يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَةِ أَإِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا So now you have two, you have two narrations. You have نَخِرَةِ and نَاخِرَةِ Okay, so some chose نَخِرَةِ because they preferred one aspect of نَخِرَةِ over the other, which is نَاخِرَةِ Others chose نَاخِرَة uh, and one of the reasons given is because it fits the rhyme scheme that with everything that precedes it. Hafira, right? Khasira, and Nakhira fits that rhyme scheme in the wazan of Fa'ida. So that's one way of ikhtiyar. But we maintain, we maintain that all of these differences are mustanad. They all return back to Either the Prophet ﷺ recited it or he approved of it. Or he approved of it. After this, certain reciters become very popular in their cities. So we're talking about the early days of Islam. Certain reciters become very popular in their cities and their readings are named after them. Um, so uh, that'll come in the next slide. But in Medina, you have certain recitations that become very prevalent and same in Mecca and same in Dimashq and same in Kufa and same in Basra. And many people begin to compile books on the various Qira'at during their times. Uh, so Ibn Mujahid, rahimahullah, he's the first to compile a book on the famous seven that we know today, right? The Sab'a Qira'at that we have today, the, those were originally compiled by Ibn Mujahid rahimahullah. However, he is not the first to compile a book on Qira'at. Um, some, some scholars uh, mention over 40, 40 compilations of Qira'at before Ibn Mujahid, most if not all of which are uh, lost today. Notably Imam At-Tabari rahimahullah, who precedes Ibn Mujahid, uh, the famous author of Tafsir Al-Tabari, he also had a book of Qira'at, which is uh, lost today, um, with about 20, 20 or so Qira'at. Ibn Mujahid, he compiles uh, the book on the seven that we know today. Here are the names of, uh, 
of ten uh, of the ten qira'a uh, the qurra the ten qurra that make up the al qira'at al ashr al mutawatira that we know today. Uh, so in Medina, in Al Medina al Munawwara, this I took from Ustada Saima, who did the same course for the sisters. So I just uh, took her slide, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward her. Imam Abu Ja'far al Madani, uh, his name is Yazid ibn al Qar. Uh, so he's the eighth canonical reciter. Uh, so I put an eight after him. Uh, but he's from Medina. Uh, then we have Imam Nafir, who's also from Medina. He's the first. Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, from Mecca. Imam Abu Amr, uh, Al-Basri, and Ya'qub, Al-Hadrami, Al-Basri. They're both from Basra. From Sham, we have Abdullah Ibn Amr, Al-Yahsabi, Al-Dimashqi. And from Kufa, we have four. We have Asim. And Imam Asim's Qira'ah is the one that is most prevalent today. Uh, from him uh, is particularly the riwaya of Hafs and the second most would be the Qira'ah of Nafir from Warsh and Qalun as well uh, also in Kufa you have Imam Hamza uh, Imam Al-Kisai and Imam Khalaf who also transmits from Hamza but he also uh, narrates his own Qira'ah as well the 10th and so I bolded the names uh, that they're well known by Abu Ja'far, Nafir, Ibn Kathir, Abu Amr, Ya'qub, Ibn Amr, Asim, Hamza, Kisai, and Khalaf, Rahimahumullahu Ta'ala. So, about Ibn Mujahid, uh, Ibn Mujahid, he's actually a student of uh, one of the Rawis, uh, one of the, the Ruat of Abdullah Ibn Kathir. Not a direct Rawi of Abdullah Ibn Kathir, but one of the famous Ruat. Qumbul, Imam Qumbul. Uh, so he's a student, Ibn Mujahid is a student of Imam Qumbul. So he he's uh, from 245 to 324 after Hijri. Uh, Kufa, yes, Kufa is the city from Iraq, in Iraq and Basra as well. Oh uh, yes, there's a typo here. It should be Basra. Jazakallah khairan. So Ibn Mujahid... His full name is Abu Bakr Ahmed ibn Musa ibn al-Abbas ibn Mujahid al-Baghdadi. So he authors Kitab al-Sabr. Why these particular seven? Why these particular seven? So um, some scholars, Dr. Shadi Nasir also mentions this in his book, that Ibn Mujahid intended to compile the single most prevalent reading for each major city. That was his intention. Um, so he only intended five. One from Medina, which is Nafir, one from Mecca, Ibn Kathir, one from Basra, Abu Amr, one from uh, Sham, Ibn Amr. And he faced a problem when trying to choose one from Kufa. And the problem that he faced is that he couldn't really decide on uh, a most prevalent one or a most popular one uh, and this is you know this is just a theory and so he notes down all three right he notes down Asim, Hamza and Kisai he he feels that he feels the need to mention all three as opposed to being able to just picking one note that in Kufa it takes a little longer for them to uh, kind of transition from the Mus'haf of Ibn Mas'ud over to the Mus'haf of Uthman radiyallahu anhu. So there's a lot more diversity happening in Kufa as well. Uh, Ibn Mujahid is extremely popular. He has a lot of students. Ibn al-Jazidi states that he does, not, he does not know anyone who had as many students as Ibn Mujahid. And his book gains a lot of fame and authority. Um, whether or not he anticipated how much fame and his book would, would gain, I'm not sure. I'd like to think that had he known, had he known how much authority and how much uh, how how popular his book, his book was going to be, he would have probably added, uh, perhaps he would have added more uh, qiraat in there that were prevalent at the time. Um, but due to the popularity of his book, other readings are uh, gradually overshadowed by the seven that he mentions. Um, 
and there comes a point where the ummah now starts inclining towards this ijma, this consensus that anything outside of these seven readings are no are not uh, mutawatir anymore. They are not re- they're not relied upon anymore. They're not that level of sahih of authenticity that they can be relied upon to recite in salah or to be considered Quran. It's a lengthy theological discussion, but the ummah starts and the scholars of the ummah start uh, inclining towards this consensus and going towards this consensus of just these seven. Um, not all at once, and it doesn't happen everywhere, as we'll, as we'll come to in a bit, but it, that's kind of the direction that scholars head towards. So we're talking about the development of the Qira'at as we know them today, right? So we have Abu Amr al-Dani. Uh, we're skipping a lot of a lot of senior Qurra, okay, for the sake of time. But there are a lot of senior Qurra, so we're going we're skipping over some generations. And Abu Amr al-Dani, he is uh, he he passes away in 444 after Hijri, and uh, his full name is Abu Amr. Uthman ibn Sa'id ibn Uthman ibn Sa'id ibn Umar al-Dani rahimahullah Dani uh, he's from uh, Andalusian Spain um, Dania is the name of the city uh, in Spain and so he authors a book At-Taysir fil Qira'at al-Sabr which is basically a textbook version of Ibn Mujahid's work with additional information uh, regarding uh, transmitters, subtransmitters, um, and kind of more uh, insight on the oral tradition of the Qira'at uh, that occurs between his time and Ibn Mujahid's time. So from Ibn Mujahid onwards, Abu Amr al-Dani, he writes this book now, at taysir It's a textbook version of Ibn Mujahid's uh, Kitab al-Sabr. Uh, and, and he adds information about transmitters and it becomes very popular and it is adopted by Qurra to teach the science to students um, Abu Amr al-Dani rahimahullah he is known as an authority figure in the science of both in the science of Tajweed and Qira'at right? Ibn al-Jazari praises him he says whoever looks in his books will realize the aptitude of this individual and how much talent Allah has given him so he was a great scholar a great uh, historian um, and uh, a great linguist. His books on Tajweed and Qira'at are both very valuable. After this, the tradition of Qira'at continues and we get to Imam al-Shatibi. His name is Abu al-Qasim, Qasim ibn Firru, ibn Khalaf, ibn Ahmad al-Shatibi, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, Firru is the name of his father, um, and ma'anahu hadid, it comes from iron. So those who are familiar with the root, the the roots of iron, and even uh, iron on the periodic table, will recognize the similarities here. Uh, he's from Spain. He's from Shatiba, and uh, he studies qiraat early on. Some say he was born blind. Some say he was. He became blind later on. He became blind later on. Um, but he's a very uh, competent and very skilled scholar um, and master of rhetoric, master of poetry, master of Quran. Um, he authors the extremely well known Hirzul Amani or Wajhut Tahani, which is better known today as the Shatibiyah. And it is based on. Imam Abu Amr al-Dani's At-Taysir. It is based on At-Taysir um, with some differences. With some differences. So Imam Shatibi, now he's transmitting um, uh, from his oral tradition, which includes Imam Abu Amr al-Dani, but it also includes other uh, other turq as well and other differences of opinion. Um, and so that's all included in 
his Shatabiya. It becomes extremely popular. It gradually replaces the Taysir as the most popular textbook for teaching Qira'at. Uh, and so because it's currently uh, the most widely taught book for Qira'at, we will, in this session, uh, go more into detail on the Shatabiya uh, near the end of this uh, presentation, inshallah. So we will focus more on the Shatabiya, but uh, and we'll talk about it in more detail. Imam Shatabi also authors other uh, nazms on on different aspects of the Quranic sciences. So he has another famous one on Rasm, on Rasm, uh, the Rasm of Uthman, uh, which is also based on uh, the book of Imam Abu Amr al Dani, who also who writes a book on Rasm, and he also has a book on Adul Ay, the differences among the Qurra. Uh, regarding verse endings regarding verse endings so this is also a part of a supplement to qiraat because not all of the qiraat have the same verse endings not all of the qiraat have the same verse endings some have a verse ending at surat al-ladhina an'amta alayhim some continue uh, and keep that one verse some consider Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim a separate verse, some don't. Some consider the huruf muqatta'at individual verses. Uh, some consider them part of the entire verse, alif lam mim dhalik al-kitabu onwards. So this is also a part of qira'at. So he has a uh, poem on this as well. What is the reason that he wrote it in poem form? Uh, Imam uh, Shatabi, he's, he's from the Maliki tradition. Right from Spain, uh, and in the Madiki tradition, if there are any Madikis here, you know that uh, they're in all of their sciences. They are very skilled at writing poems. Their textbooks in poem form, uh, for the sake of memorizing, memorizing them, and they use that uh, memorization to recall information. And so that's the purpose of writing. So the the initial purpose and a lot of a lot of teachers will still act upon this was to memorize the shatabiya so that it's easy to recall the different rules and the different uh, variants of qiraat so people would memorize the shatabiya and they still do to this day people memorize the shatabiya from beginning to end then we'll jump forward in time and we reach al-muhaqqiq ibn al-jaziri Rahimahullah, who passes away in 833 after after Hijri, and his full name is Abu Khair Shamsuddin Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Ali ibn Yusuf al Dimashqi, famously known as Ibn al Jazri, um, uh, which is uh, a reference to the area, uh, the Jazira that he was at, and he is known as Al Muhaqqiq because of his immense contributions and research in the field. Al-Muhaqqiq, the one who does tahqiq. Uh, so much rigorous research he did on the various turuq. Uh, so he was, um, even from today's standards, he, was, he had a lot of resources. He was well off. He came from a well off background. He had uh, wealth. He came from a wealthy background, which allowed him to travel a lot. And Jazahullah uh, Khairan, he used that for the service of the science and the service of this, uh, uh, the the tahqiq of the recitation of the Quran, that he used his wealth to travel and kind of collect a sanid and do research on the various qira'at, the, the, those that were canonical at the time, those that were uh, well known by some, but not by others. So he authors many books on tajweed and qira'at, including the most famous, uh, his most famous work, which is uh, the most widely studied tajweed book uh, today. Um, I, I would say it's very difficult to find anyone who would give an ijaza in the riwayah of Hafs without making you study the muqaddimah of Imam al-Jazari. 
the full title of which is Al Muqaddimah Fi Ma'ala Qari'ihi An Ya'lamah Fi Ma'ala Qari'i Al-Qur'an An Ya'lamah So that's his brief uh, poem on Tajweed Not Qira'at but Tajweed uh, He also authors Ad-Durra Ad-Durra Al-Mudiyah uh, which is on the Thalath, Al-Qira'at, Al-Thalath, the three additional Qira'at that make the ten Qira'at. He authors Tayyibat Al-Nashr, which is on the entire ten Qira'at um, with more Turuq. Uh, and, then he, his, and that's also in poem form. It's in poem form to, uh, for, uh, as a textbook. And then he also authors Al-Nashr, Fil Qira'at Al-Ashr, which is known as his magnum opus, it's uh, it's his uh, basically his research of all of the different asanid on the qiraat, the ten qiraat, and in expanded form of the tayyiba. He demonstrates during his lifetime. He demonstrates and proves the authenticity of the three additional qiraat so decisively, so decisively that uh, it is accepted by the consensus of the ulama. Because before him, before him, the consensus was leaning towards there are no more, uh, the, other than the seven, there are no additional uh, qira'at that are sahiha or that are acceptable. And uh, for example, if you look at Imam al nawawis book, At-Tibiyan, At-Tibiyan fi adabi hamlat al-Qur'an, uh, Imam al nawawi mentions in there that it is only acceptable to recite from the seven known qira'at. Imam al nawawi uh, I'm pretty sure, comes before the time of Imam al jazidi 95% sure. Um, and, and that is the context uh, of which he's writing that. Imam al jazidi proves, uh, and he proves that or he demonstrates that the three additional qira'at, the qira'at of Abu Ja'far and Ya'qub and Khalaf, those three qira'at are widely known enough to the point where they have reached the same authenticity of the other seven qira'at. And so some now some people today will Dis- differentiate between the, the three qira'at versus the seven. Some will say that the sab'a, al-qira'at, the sab'a, they are mutawatira. Uh, and then they'll say al-qira'at, al-thalath, the, the three additional ones, they are mashura. They'll make this distinction between mutawatira and mashura. As far as I can tell, wallahu alam, uh, the earlier scholars, Imam al jazidi does not make such a distinction. In fact, he argues that they are all the same level of authenticity. Um, and so uh, he argues that there is basically no difference of fame or uh, authenticity uh, between the three and the seven. And that's why most, most scholars today will refer to, it, to them all as al-qira'at, al-ashr, al-mutawatira, uh, the ten mutawatir, uh, authentic qira'at. Uh, as to how he demonstrates and proves that, uh, proves that uh, he goes through it in his books. Uh, it is not something that we have the time for, unfortunately. Um, but his work, Ad-Durra, which is on the Thalath, on the three additional qira'at of Abu Ja'far, Ya'qub, and Khalaf, is meant to sum- supplement the Shatibiyya. So just as we'll talk about the Shatubiyya in more detail, we'll also talk about the Durra in more detail and what that means, what it means that, uh, to supplement the Shatubiyya. Over here, I think it's necessary to just clarify what is meant by Qira'at, Riwayat, and Turuq. A Qira'a is a reading that's attributed to a particular Qari of the Ten Qurra. It consists of two Riwayat. Okay, so we say, actually, let me finish reading this slide. So the 10 Qurra that we have, uh, the two from Medina, one from Mecca, the two from Basra, one from Sham, uh, and four from Kufa. 
So they each have two rawis, right? The plural of rawi is ruah, ruat. So they each have two rawis. So uh, if the rawis agree on certain points, then that reading will just refer to as, it will be referred to as the qira'ah. For example, because we're going to talk about this a lot, there's Maliki Yawmuddin versus Maliki Yawmuddin. Right? Maliki Yawmuddin is recited by Imam Asim. We can divide Imam Asim into his two rawis, Shorba and Hafs. Um, so technically, we can say that Imam Shorba and Imam Hafs both say Maliki Yawmuddin. But a quicker way to say that is to say Imam Asim says Maliki Yawmuddin. So it literally means the same thing, but it's used by the, the authors and the teachers in this way, kind of to, uh, I think, to make the teaching aspect of it easier and also just to show historically where they differed and where they didn't differ. Uh, the riwayah is the subcategory, the immediate subcategory of a qira'ah, so a reading attributed to a particular Rawi, that's known as a riwayah, of a qari. Okay, so you have the qari and then the subcategory is the rawi. So the qari that you have is, for example, Asim and the rawis, Hafs, Shorba and Hafs. And then you also have, uh, for Imam Nafir, you have Warsh and Qalun. So these are direct students. Uh, not every rawi that we have in these uh, is a direct student of the qari. Uh, sometimes there are gaps in the chain, not gaps in the chain as in their unknowns, but rather the name, the name of the riwayah is attributed to a person later on. Um, and that's kind of just how it stuck. That the fame of the re reading was associated with the particular person. So Imam Susi and Dudi, who are the rawis of Imam Abu Amr al-Basri, they don't narrate directly from Abu Amr, but rather through Yahya al-Yazidi. Yahya al-Yazidi. But they're known as the Rawi. So we say the riwayah of Duri, the riwayah of Susi from Abu Amr with the understanding that there is a person in between. Okay, Riwayat may differ with one another. And that's where you have a difference within a Qira'ah. A difference within a Qira'ah is known, uh, is, is due to the differences of the Riwayat. Differences of the riwayat. Then the subcategory of riwayah is the tariq. The plural is turuq. So tariq is the subcategory of riwayah. It is a reading attributed to our, our particular rawi of a qari. Okay. So then the, the ruat will have different things attributed to them. Okay. And these tend to be lesser differences. Uh, but occasionally uh, less serious or less um, shocking differences. Uh, but occasionally you will have major differences. What, what I mean by that is that, for example, in different turuq of Imam Hafs, we have different turuq of Imam Hafs. So the popular one that we have is, we know it, we generally refer to it as the tariq of Imam Shatibi. The riwayah of Hafs from the tariq of Imam Shatibi However, Imam Shatabi is narrating it from a particular tariq, right? Uh, um, but the other turuq that Imam Ibn al-Jazri mentions, they won't have, for example, uh, there will be differences in the mad munfasil. The mad munfasil. I'm assuming most of you are familiar with the rules of tajweed. Um, so they'll have uh, differences in the mad munfasil or in a, in a particular tariq of Imam Hafs, there won't be those, a sekta in those famous places like Kalla Bal Rana. In, in some turuq of Hafs, you'll have Kalla Bal Rana, Waqila Marraq, etc. So you have differences like that. And then every subcategory below Riwayat and below turuq will also be counted among the turuq. So a subcategory of tariq is also a tariq. Khair. So let's talk about the Shatibiyya. The Shatibiyya is this brilliant poem uh, in many aspects because 
it's just a a wonderful form of of literature in which it's beautifully presented uh, many things are happening uh, so it is in the tawil meter of poetry for those who are familiar badatu bi bismillahi fin nadmi awwala تبارك رحمن رحيما وموئلا وثنيت صلى الله ربي على الرضا محمد المهدى إلى الناس مرسلا وعترته ثم الصحابة ثم من تلاهم على الإحسان بالخير والبلا وثلثت أن الحمد لله دائما وما ليس مبدوءا به أجذم العلا So this is his beginning خطبة um, uh, حمدا الصلوات uh, And you'll see that Every line ends with the syllable la for the entire duration of this poem. For the entire duration of the poem, every syllable ends with uh, every line ends with the syllable la, um, uh, which is why it's also known as the lamia. Now, the muqaddima of this of this poem of this text explains to the reader how you're supposed to read the book, how the poem is to be read and deciphered. So after his whole khutbah, وَبَعْدُ فَحَبْلُ اللَّهِ فِينَا كِتَابُهُ uh, Just a side note, on, his, on the muqaddima, he just employs so much rhetorical brilliance uh, with alliteration and using different roots and making puns, uh, using the same root to make different words and meanings. Um, and it's just very enjoyable and, and wonderful to read. Um, but then he, ex- he introduces the Qurra. He introduces the Qurra. And so we have a chart here. Um, and he says that he will follow the Abjad system, particularly the Western, the Maghribi Abjad system. So there are are two abjad systems. One was more prevalent in the mashriq, uh, mashriq and one was more prevalent in the maghrib. So the one in the mashriq goes um, abjad hawas hutti kaliman sa'fas qarshat thakhad dhaddagh. But the one in maghrib, abjad hawas hutti kaliman, it starts with a sad instead of seen, sa'fad qarshat. That's the Maghribi one differs here. So he uses this one. And uh, basically, he says that each person will be represented by a letter in the poem. So, abaj and wow is subtracted from the equation from consideration because it's used to divide the different messiah that he will present. It's wow al fasila, right? Because it's used as and, it's used as a conjunction. So he'll use it as a conjunction, so he won't use it to refer to any person. So you're left with abaj, the haz, hutti, kalim, nasar, fadak, rasat, thakhad, vagash. Every reciter is represented by one of these, and it goes in the order that he presents them in the poem. He starts with nafir. Qalun, Warsh, Ibn Kathir, Bazi, Qumbul, Abu Amr. He presents them all in this order. And then the reader is to understand that each letter will refer to the Qari in that order. So, Abaj, Anafir. And the way that we teach it uh, to Qira'at students, Anafir, Baqalun, Jawarsh, Dabnu Kathir, Habazi, Zakumbul, Ha Abu Amr, Taduri, Yasusi. كابن عامر لهشام مبني ذكوان نعاصم سشور باع حفص فحمزة ضخلف قخلاد ركسائس أبو الحارث التدوري. Right, and a student is expected to memorize this. It doesn't take too long, um, but it makes it very easy. It makes it much easier to uh, then engage with the text and engage with the various books of قراءات and remember certain rules. So uh, you have. Nafi' al-Madani, his two rawis, Qalun and Warsh. Then Ibn Kathir is Daqari, and his rawi, rawi. Abu Amr Daqari, rawi, susi, rawi, duri, uh, rawi, duri, rawi, susi. Ibn Amr is Daqari, and then his rawi, Hisham, Ibn Dhaqwan. Asim is Daqari, his rawi, Shorba, and Hafs. 
Hamza Zdaqari, Khalaf and Khalad are his rawis, Kisai Zdaqari and Abu al-Harith and Duri, the same Duri who transmits from Abu Amr, he also transmits from Al-Kisai as well. Okay. In addition, Imam Shatibi, then he mentions how his poem is laid out. So he kind of creates this rule of opposites. He creates for his poem this rule of opposites, which he uses for the poem, meaning he will mention a particular reading and he will mention who does that. And then he won't mention the other reading. Like he'll mention who says Maliki. And then he won't explicitly say who says Maliki. It can be deduced through his system of opposites. So he'll have a whole system in which the opposite of a fatha is this, the opposite of a lamma is this, the opposite of mad is this, the opposite of qasr is this, the opposite. So he'll have, he'll have opposites. And what makes it a little uh, even more confusing uh, and challenging is that some of these opposites don't work backwards. Um, so we're not going to get into that. Uh, but if you do study the Shatibiyah, it's something that you'll learn. Um, that some of the opposites don't work backwards. They're only one way that he'll mention one thing and it will, impl it will imply another reading. It will imply another reading. But if he mentions that other, the other side, it won't imply the first one. It will actually imply something else. So opposites that don't work backwards. Khair. He, so basically the muqaddimah of the Shatibiyah is to... Uh, is basically it lays out how to read the poem uh, and he makes it very clear exactly what he's going to do, how he's going to present it and I've summarized it here uh, very briefly. So the organization of the Shatabiya, it's important to it's important to mention that the Shatabiya is a book of Qira'at, not of Tajweed. Okay, and there's a difference between Qira'at and Tajweed and Unfortunately, a lot of people don't seem to under or don't seem to to know that uh, immediately. Um, even within the science, or those who are familiar with the science, the juid has to do with the pronunciation of the letters, and it and it does not have to do with a particular qira'a. The, the makharij of the huruf and the sifat of the huruf, uh, they are more or less all the same within the qira'at. It's the sifat aridha, the mad and the qasr and, and those things like that, that the qira'at will differ. But uh, tajweed is a more linguistic science uh, with a linguistic theory behind it. And if you read the book, the core text of tajweed, the core texts of tajweed are different than the core texts of qira'at. The core texts of tajweed are different than the core texts of qira'at. The jazariya is a text of tajweed. The Shatibiyya is a book of Qira'at. The Durra is a book of Qira'at. Right? Uh, At-Taysir fi sabra is a book of Qira'at. At-Tamheed fi ilm al tajweed is a book of Tajweed by Imam Ibn al-Jaziri. Right? So, it's, this all sounds very obvious now, but then we must also apply this to certain situations that we wouldn't normally think and that is that there are some people who may be very skilled in qira'at and it's a sad state of affairs but we must we must mention it for the sake of intellectual um, uh, to per, for the sake of intellectual uh, all, intellectual humility but also intellectual um, what's the word honesty that there are some people who are very skilled in qira'at uh, but not in tajweed they have issues in tajweed. So they'll, ha they'll perhaps have an ijazah in the qira'at al-ashr, but they'll have issues of certain parts of tajweed, right? That's not to say tajweed is black and white. There are a lot of issues of tajweed, but that's for a different course. This, this course is specifically on qira'at. Um, but it's important to not conflate the two sciences and not conflate expertise of the two sciences. Okay. So the author of this text assumes that the reader is already familiar with the rules and theory of Tajweed. 
Okay, so you're you're approaching this book uh, knowing the rules of Tajweed. It won't talk about Tajweed. Briefly near the end of the Shatabiya, some Makharij, the Makharij and Sifat are mentioned, but nowhere in detail like the, the, the Jazariya or books of Tajweed. The Jazariya, I wouldn't even say, is a detailed book of Tajweed, but a, a summary. The Shatabiya is divided into two parts, uh, Usul and Farsh. So the Usul and Farsh, these are what constitute the differences among the Qira'at. So what are Usul? Usul are the general rules for the Qira'at pertaining to things like Imala. So Imala is like, uh, is what happens in Sabbihisma Rabbika Al-A'la versus Sabbihisma Rabbika Al-A'la. That is Imala. That's what's known as Imala. So this will fall under the Usul, general rules that can be generally applied. Idgham, also, some people will have some qira'at will have additional rules of idgham, right? Labithtum uh, will become labithtum with idgham. Qad ja'a will become qad ja'a, etc. Mad will fall under usul. Some some qira'at will have lengthier mad. Some qira'at will have uh, mads which are not found in other qira'at. Uh, so it will apply to differences in accents, pronunciations, mostly, and will generally not affect the meaning. Generally, usul differences do not affect the meaning. Um, there are some exceptions, um, but not uh, signif significant enough to mention here. Uh, it can also apply to practices and traditions associated with qira'at, with, with the qira'ah of the Qur'an. For example, al-hal wal-murtahil, takbir bayna suratain, basmala silently or loudly. So, basmala silently or loudly is associated with Imam Hamza and Nafir, right? They'll say, it's reported from them to recite the basmala silently. Uh, so this is also something that would fall under usul differences. Um, Takbir bayna suratain from Surah al duha all the way to Surah Al-Nas. Uh, it is reported from Imam Ibn Kathir uh, to do takbir between the surahs. So, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ أَلَّهُ أَكْبَرْ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكْ um, And so, uh, that is something that will fall under Usul as well, a practice that would fall under Usul, Al-Hal wal murtahil the practice of completing Surah Al-Nas and then starting again from Surah Al-Fatiha and reciting into Surah Al-Baqarah up to Muflihun. This is also a practice. Um, one thing that I would mention here is that many scholars of Hadith will have an issue with these practices, Al-Hal wal murtahil Takbir Bayna Suratain, um, in particular, these two, both of which are mentioned in the Shatabiya, Al-Hal and Murtahil, and Takbir Bayna Suratain, some Muhaddithun will have, scal will have issue with this due to them being uh, weak ahadith. And this, the answer is usually that the science of Qira'at uh, should not be the usul of hadith should not be projected onto the science of qira'at. The science of qira'at is its own science with its own rules and its own tradition. And these traditions, these practices have been transmitted among the qurra. If authentically, and Imam ibn al-Jazari, he, especially when talking about uh, takbir bayn al-suratain, he goes to the point where he says, hatta balagha, that it has reached the point of tawatur, that's how famous it is uh, for these things. So they should be looked at from the perspective of the tradition of the Qurra, in which these traditions are preserved among the Qurra. Um, and so it's very important not to project the usul, uh, not to incorrectly project the usul of one science onto another. The farsh are to do with the differences among the qira'at that do not fall under a particular rule or pattern. Uh, they're individual differences that will usually will affect the meaning. So differences of gender case, grammatical case, 
verb conjunction, singular, plural nouns, differences in letters, etc. All of those things will apply here. Uh, common, a famous example, Maliki Yomidin versus Maliki Yomidin. Slightly changes the meaning. King versus master. Okay, so this will fall under Farsh. Uh, some things um, will fall under Farsh that don't affect the meaning, right? But they'll fall under Farsh due to their rarity of occurrence. So when we say affects the meaning, we mean uh, what I discussed earlier, that it will add nuance. It will add nuance to the meaning and it will, uh, it will assist scholars of tafsir uh, in the depth of the message of the Qur'an. So here's an example of deciphering the farsh from the shatibiya. The farsh are the individual differences that don't fall under a particular rule. So this, whole, this is from the chapter of after going through all of the usul of the qiraat, the remainder of the shatibiya is to do with the farsh, the individual differences. So here are two verses, two verses from the chapter of Surah Al-Baqarah, the farsh of Surah Al-Baqarah. وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ الْفَتْحُ مِنْ قَبْلِ سَاكِنٍ وَبَعْدُ ذَكَا وَالْغَيْرُ كَالْحَرْفِ أَوَّلَا Okay. So, he's talking about وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ in يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ This وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ There is a difference here among the Qurra. And so, he says وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ الْفَتْحُ مِنْ قَبْلِ سَاكِنٍ Okay, that's how it's presented. وَبَعْدُ وَبَعْدُ ذَكَى So as it's presented, is for ذَكَى ذَال refers to the Kufiyun, which are Asim Hamza Kisai, with the addition of Ibn Amr. With the addition of Ibn Amr. Right. Dal, Kufiyun, Ibn Amr. So, that's how he's presented here. And then, وَالْغَيْرُ كَالْحَرْفِ awwala. Everyone else, besides them, everyone else, كَالْحَرْفِ awwala, Like the first, the first instance, and he's talking about يُخَادِعُونَ, the first time it comes. So, everyone besides the Kufiyun, Ibn Amr, We'll say, وَمَا يُخَادِعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ Okay, so that, the next verse, وَخَفَّفَ كُوفٍ كُوفٍ refers to the Kufiyun, عَاصِمْ حَمْزَنْ كَسَائِي وَخَفَّفَ كُوفٍ يَكْذِبُونَ وَيَاؤُهُ بِفَتْحٍ وَلِلْبَاقِينِ ضُمَّ وَثُقِّلَ The Kufin will recite, يَكْذِبُونَ وَالتَّخْفِيف Takhfif is the opposite of tathqil, meaning the opposite of tashdeed. So he explains that the kufiyun will recite it like this, walilbaqin for the rest, dhumma wa thuqila, dhamma and the ya, you, and then the tashdeed, uh, tathqil of the dal, yukadhibun. So everyone besides the kufiyun will recite, bima kanu yukadhibun here. Bima kanu yukadhibun. So that's a way, that's a, an example of deciphering farsh from the shatibiya. Okay. Now, luckily, luckily in today's age, we have commentaries, uh, dozens and dozens of commentaries on the shatibiya that do this for you and explain it for you. And they go into detail. And so under each verse, they'll explain exactly what's going on if the poetry becomes too hard. You have commentaries like Al-Wafi and Siraj Al-Qari and things like, and other, other books, other famous uh, commentaries uh, for teachers and students alike to, uh, this, to help you and assist you in deciphering these verses. But at the very least, it's, it's good and important for the student to know how to decipher how to decipher uh, the fudge from the Shatubiyah.
particularly this becomes useful for those who memorize the Shatabiya in order to recall and, mem and in doing so they're essentially kind of memorizing the Qira'at um, when they memorize the Shatabiya they're able to recall exactly what's going on so without knowing exactly how to decipher the verses then the memorization kind of um, kind of becomes useless so it particularly useful it's particularly useful for those who memorize the Shatabiya to know exactly how to decipher the verses but all students should know the Durra the Durra by Imam Ibn al-Jazari rahimahullah this is written to supplement Imam al-Shatabi's book it mimics its meter and its features قُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي وَحْدَهُ عَلَىٰ وَمَجِّدْهُ وَاسْأَلْعَوْنَهُ وَتَوَسَّلَىٰ same meter and the same feature of every syllable ending with la every line ending with the syllable la and so uh, imam al jazri uh, this is basically his his love letter to imam al-shatibi and his 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 appreciation to him uh, that he imitated his poem uh, in the same meter and form uh, and then it's also not a standalone text. It needs the Shatabiya to be deciphered. What does that mean? That means Imam Ibn al Jazari will only mention those instances. This only pertains to three Qurra, right? Three Qurra and two Riwayat each, just like Imam uh, Shatabi did. If the, if the Qadi is unmentioned, if is, if is left unmentioned, that means he'll agree with the pair, with his pair from the Shatabiya. What does that mean? Here are, so the codes in the, the codes in the Durra are simply Abaj, Hutti, and Fadaq. That's it. And that's Abu Ja'far and his Rawi Ibn Wardan and Ibn Jammaz. Hutti, which is Ya'qub, uh, and his Rawi's Ruwais and Rawh. And Fadaq for Khalaf, who transmits from Hamza, and this is his own Qira'a now, and uh, Ishaq and Idris. Now, incident incidentally, Ishaq and Idris don't differ at all. So they don't differ at all. But Imam al Jazari, for the sake of consistency, he mentions both of them uh, just to have to be, to be consistent in the two Rawi uh, per Qari system. Abu Ja'far corresponds with Nafir al-Madani. They're from Medina, both from Medina. So he'll course, that's his pair in the Shatabiya. Ya'qub corresponds with Abu Amr. They're both from Basra. That's his pair. And Khalaf corresponds with Hamza. That's his pair. Uh, they're both from Kufa. So what this is saying is that Abu Ja'far, right, um, and Abu Ja'far will only be mentioned, his differences in certain farsh will only be mentioned if they are different from Imam Nafir. Ya'qub's differences will only be mentioned if they are different from Abu Amr. And Khalaf will only be mentioned if they are different from Hamza. If they are not mentioned, then the implication is that, what is implied is that they agree with their corresponding pair. That Abu Ja'far will agree with Nafir if it's not mentioned. Ya'qub will agree with Abu Amr if it's not mentioned. Khalaf will agree with Hamza if it's not mentioned. An example, Surah Al-Baqarah again. So he starts off, حروف التحجي حروف التحجي فصل بسكت كحا ألف ألا يخدعون علم حجا وشميما طلا So he starts off with Surah Al-Baqarah, he says, the huruf al-tahajji, also known as huruf al-muqatta'at, uh, like alif, lam, mim, ha, mim, yasin, he says, will be separated with a sect by Hamza, which is for Abu Ja'far. The reason it's mentioned, because he differs from Nafir. Nafir doesn't do this. And the example of this is, instead of alif, lam, mim, He'll say, Alif, Lam, Mim, right? Ha, Mim. Yakhda'un, as we discussed earlier. Remember, we said, Yakhda'un is, uh, 
Ibn Amir and the Kufiyun and Yukhadi'un is everyone else. Okay, so he's saying, he says Yakhda'un, which means someone does Yakhda'un. I'lam. That's for Abu Ja'far. Abu Ja'far goes against Nafi' and says Yakhda'un instead of Yukhadi'un. Hijan. Ya'qub goes against Abu Amr who says Yukhadi'un. Ya'qub says Yakhda'un. Who's not mentioned? Khalaf is not mentioned. Khalaf is not mentioned because he does not go against Hamza. So if we want to know what Khalaf, the 10th canonical reciter, says, we have to refer to the Shatibiya. Khalaf says Yakhda'un. So Yakhda'un for Khalaf. Or Hamza says Yakhda'un in the Shatibiya. So Khalaf, who is not mentioned here, must also say Yakhda'un. Okay? And then Washmi Mantila, that's a separate uh, additional masala which you'll have to study the durra for. Um, but we're running out of time, so I really want to quickly demonstrate the Fatiha. Uh, and so we have ample time for questions as well. In teaching the Qira'at, in teaching the Qira'at, when you actually get to reciting the Qur'an, then uh, the, te- the Qura' will uh, apply something known as Jamr. Jamr. Okay. Initially, initially, when the Qiraat were taught, it would have it would be riwaya at a time, riwaya at a time. You recite the entire riwaya and the whole Quran in an entire riwaya, then you do it again. But naturally, you know, as the science carries on and students begin to increase, there is a need for efficiency, and so jama is introduced as a uh, didactic method, a method of teaching, um, and it should be noted that its its application is for teaching and learning only, and just to demonstrate teaching, but not for a substitute of reciting the Quran as ibadah, as worship. It would be incorrect to recite in this form uh, for normal worship. It is simply for teaching. So, jama is to combine the various qira'at at once while reciting. There are many forms of jama that have been introduced by the scholars. Jama bil waqf, also known as jama waqfi, one recites an entire verse or portion of a verse according to the first uh, qira, according to the the first qira'a. So, you recite in the order of qurra. You recite in the order of qurra, and usually the order is as presented by Imam Shatabi. You start with qalun. You start with Nafir, then Ibn Kathir, then Abu Amr, Ibn Amr, Asim, Hamza, Kisai. Which means you start with their Rawis. Qalun, Warsh, Duri, Susi, etc. So on and so forth. So every time you start a verse, you're starting with Qalun. And then you go on. So you, so according to Jamar bil Waqf, you recite the verse, and you, the entire verse or a portion of the verse where it's appropriate to stop, uh, according to one reading, then you restart the verse, you restart the verse from the beginning for the next reading and continue to where you stopped. And then you do this until all the variants have been exhausted. And I'll demonstrate this inshallah. Jamar bil harf, one begins reciting a verse when they reach a point of ikhtilaf, they cycle on the word until all variants have been completed and then they move forward. Okay, you'll notice this in Abdul Basit, uh, his famous uh, recording of وَقَالَتْ هَيْتَ لَكْ هِتَ وَقَالَتْ هِتَ All of those different variants He cycles on it That's a form of Jamar bil harf And then The method of Imam Safaqusi That one recites a verse for a single Qari Until reaching an appropriate pause Then they work their way backward To account for all of the differences This is Probably the most uh, Popular form Popular method today um, in addition to Jamar bil Harf, they each have their pros and cons. Okay, so some scholars you'll find in history they have a they'll have an issue with any form of Jamar. Uh, Ibn al Jawzi, I believe, is the author of Talbis Iblis. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he writes in Talbis Iblis uh, that it is a bid'ah to do Jamar of the Quran. He has a huge problem with it, right? And that's his opinion, but the majority of 
the probably the consensus of Qurra is to allow it. However, Jamar bil Harf is something that uh, certain Qurra in history have expressed some discomfort for because it kind of messes with the nazam of the Quran. Um, but it is the most convenient. And Jamra, the Jamra bil Waqf preserves for the most part the nazam of the Quran and the flow of the Quran and is also uh, efficient when you use Imam Safaqusi's method. So let's demonstrate. Uh, let's demonstrate. Yes, inshallah, I, this is being recorded. So inshallah, we'll have this uploaded Surah Al-Fatiha in the Shatibiyya wa maliki yawmiddini rawihi nasirun wa inda siratin wa sirati li qumbula okay so he says maliki yawmiddin is for kisa'iyan and asim rawihi refers to the ra refers to kisa'i and nasirun refers to asim so they recite maliki due to his rules of opposites it can be inferred that the rest recite Maliki. Wa'in the Siratin was Sirati li Qumbula with a scene for Sirat for Qumbul, Bihaythu Atta, wherever it appears, was Sada Zayan Ashimmaha, Lada Khalafin was Shmim li Khalada, li Khaladi Lawala. So Hamza has two Rawis, Khalaf and Khalad. They're divided here. Instead of just saying Hamza has something, Hamza does Ishmam, which is Ishmam of the sa of the Saad with Zai, uh, which means he recites the Saad in this instance uh, with a voiced with a voiced particle like az az So he divides Khalaf and Khalad because for Khalaf it's all the time. For Khalad it's only in this instance in az Khalad will only say it in the first instance of Surah Fatiha. عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَيْهِمْ حَمْزَةٌ وَلَدَيْهِمْ جَمِيعًا بِضَمِّ الْحَاءِ وَقْفًا وَمَوْصِلًا Whether he's stopping or starting on these three words عَلَيْهِمْ إِلَيْهِمْ and لَدَيْهِمْ Imam Hamza will recite with the dhamma of ha. He will say عَلَيْهُمْ إِلَيْهُمْ لَدَيْهُمْ So only عَلَيْهُمْ appears in Surah Al-Fatiha but Imam Shatibi, he takes the opportunity to express the, the whole rule here. The whole rule here. He takes that opportunity to express it. And then he says, وَصِلْ ضَمَّ مِيمِ الْجَمْعِ قَبْلَ مُحَرَّكٍ ذِرَاكًا وَقَالُونٌ بِتَخْيِيرِهِ جَلَى And Imam Ibn Kathir, who is represented by Dal, will do what's known as the Sila of the Mimul Jamra. So in عَلَيْهِمْ, he'll say عَلَيْهِمُ عَلَيْهِمُ Qalun will do the same thing with an option. So what you'll find when you're studying the Qira'at is that many Qurra have options. They have an option to do a particular rule due to uh, different turuq being transmitted from them. So Imam Shatibi combines those and, say, and says there are options for this rawi. Um, and so Imam Qalun has an option here. And just to complete 10, we'll do the durra as well. After introducing the basmala, he says, Wamaliki huzfuz. So ha and fa. Ha is for uh, Ya'qub, who will go against Abu Amr, and instead of Maliki, he'll say Maliki. And Khalaf will go against Hamza, instead of Maliki, he will say Maliki. And we'll notice that um, Abu Ja'far is not mentioned here, which means he agrees with Maliki for Imam uh, Nafir. والصراط في حس جلا صراط for Imam خلف Imam خلف will not say الصراط but rather he will say الصراط uh, going against Imam حمزة in the شاطبية وبالسيني طيب Imam رويس who is a transmitter of يعقوب will go against أبو عمر and say اهدينا الصراط وكسر عليهم إليهم لديهم so Hamza uh, Khalaf will go against Hamza and do and recite alayhim ilayhim ladayhim like everyone else. And but Ya'qub Ya'qub will go against Abu Amr and say alayhum ilayhum ladayhum. 
So Yaqub will agree with Hamza in the Shatubiyah. And then, uh, what's mentioned here is, Fatan, uh, yes. Although, عَنِ الْيَاءِ إِنْ تَسْكُنْ سِوَى الْفَرْضِ وَضْمُمٍ إِنْ تَزُلْ طَابَ إِلَّا مَنْ يُوَلْهِمْ Okay, so I, I missed, uh, I should have added one more line as well. But then Imam Abu Ja'far will also, he will recite عَلَيْهِمْ uh, with Sila, like Ibn Kathir, and one of Qanun's options. So really quickly here. Really quickly here, I'll recite um, just to demonstrate how the Jamra takes place. So a person who's reciting, a student who's reciting, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين There are no differences here. So I recited for Qalun and everyone else was covered. There's no need to repeat. There's no need to repeat anyone who agrees with Imam Qalun. Ar-Rahmanir Rahim. Same thing. And then I start with Imam Qalun. Here are the people who say Maliki, but I start with Imam Qalun. He's first on the list. Maliki Yawmiddin. And then, after I've said that, then I say, Maliki Yawmiddin for Asim, Kisai, Yaqub, Khalaf. And if I say it for Asim, it covers for everyone. Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een. Ihdina sirat al mustaqeem. That was for Imam Qalun. Everyone who agreed with that will uh, be covered. Now, then I go back. Who's next on the list with the difference? Imam Qumbul, who recites it with the scene. When I recite it with the scene, it will also cover for Imam Ruwais. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Next on the list is Ishmam for Imam Hamza. إِهْدِينَ الظِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ And that's all the variants covered. I'm doing this in Jamr'a Waqfi, by the way. Jamr'a bil Waqf. صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Okay. That's Ishmam. Or that's uh, Qalun's version. And everyone who covers, who's covered with him. Then you also have Seen. For Qumbul and Ruwais, so Sirat al an'amta alayhim. Okay, this sila only only kicks in, the alayhimu only kicks in if you're doing wasl, if you're continuing. But if you're doing waqf, there is no sila. They will not stop as alayhimu, but they will just stop as alayhim. And then for khalaf only, because Khalad only does it here. Khalaf only from Hamza. Zirat al-lazina an'amta alayhum. Okay. Then we have Imam, Imam Ruwais. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhum. Okay. I actually missed. And then we have Rawah. Sirat al-lazina an'amta alayhum. So I didn't miss it because we're doing Jamar bil Waqf. So that's the order. So Ruwais and then Ruh alayhum. Okay. Ghayri al maghdubi alayhim wa la dhalin. Ghayri al maghdubi alayhim wa la dhalin. غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. Three ways of saying عليهم, and that was جمع بالوقف. If I were to do جمع uh, بالحرف, 
it would be something like this. Maliki Maliki Yawmiddin Ihdin Asir So Iyaka Na'budu wa Iyaka Nasta'een Ihdin Asirat 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 Al-Mustaqeem Sirata al-lazina, sirata al-lazina, zirata al-lazina an'amta alayhum, alayhim, alayhim, alayhim. So things like, that's when cycling comes in. Jam'a bil-harf. According, to, and if you're doing according to Imam Safaqusi's method, then you work your way backwards. What that means is, for example, if I recite, the entire from Sirat all the way till the uh, all the way till the end. Sirat al-Ladina an'amta alayhim ghayri al-maghdubi alayhim wa lazzalleen for Imam Qalun. Now I go back and do Imam Qalun's version with Sila here. He has two ways of reciting this entire ayah. And so I can just start from here. Because that's the previous difference. I don't have to go all the way to the beginning. So I say, عَلَيْهِمُ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمُ And I've covered for Imam Bazi, who is the other narrator of Ibn Kathir. Right? And uh, Imam Abu Jafar. Then... I missed Abu Jafar here. I forgot to add him. So if you are taking notes, just add that Abu Jafar would also be here. Um, and then after doing that, then I'd go back to Sirata and recite it. Or I'd still go, I have one more left with Sirata because I'm in Sirata mode right now. So when I'm working my way backwards, I'm assuming everyone I'm reading for and f filling differences in for, I'll read Sirata. And so Imam Ya'qub from, um, from Rawh also reads Sirata. So I can just start from, but he reads Alayhum. So I just read Alayhum ghayri al-maghdubi alayhum wa Then I go back to Sirata and I change it to Sirata for next the next one on the list, which is Qumbul. Sirata al-lazina an'amta alayhimu ghayri al-maghdubi alayhimu wa lazzalleen Now Ruwais agreed with Sirata all the way until alayhimu Ruwais does not recite alayhimu, he'll recite alayhum So I can just start from the place where Imam Ruwais broke off عَلَيْهُمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهُمْ وَلَا الظَّالِينَ And I'm left with those who do Ishmam, which is Imam Khalaf. One person who does Ishmam. ظِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهُمْ غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهُمْ وَلَا الظَّالِينَ Ameen. That is the ah uh, yes. I would go into the masala of dad versus lad, but because this a this is a qiraat a qiraat course uh, and not a tajweed course, I cannot go into that right now. But inshallah in the future, uh, we can discuss that mas'ala. Uh, but rest assured, it is deliberate. Jazakumullahu ahsan al jaza. Uh, what I was saying is, that was the method of Imam al-Safaqusi. Another thing that is over here is that al-Rahim Maliki. Imam Susi, you've probably heard. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki That will only apply during wasl If you're doing wasl If you're joining If you're joining the qira If you're joining these verses together If you're not joining the verses And you're doing waqf here And you're doing uh, And then you're doing ibtida from here 
then that variant won't apply. But you'll hear reciters cycle like الرحمن الرحيم ملك الرحيم ملك الرحيم مالك يوم الدين That's a version of Jamr bil harf Okay, so that's just a quick uh, overview of the, of the Surah Al-Fatiha and how it's derived from the Shatubiya and the Durra and how we recite according to the method of Jamra. I apologize for going over time. Uh, just a last couple of points. The way that the science is taught, is depend it depends upon the teacher. Some require the memorization of the text. Not everyone does. Okay, so the teachers will vary. Traditions of the science will vary. Some require memorization. Some don't require memorization. Uh, but they do require competency to a certain level. Ijazat will vary. Um, whether you recite the entire Qur'an from beginning to end will vary, or whether it's a combination of reciting and listening. Uh, that will also vary. Methods of Jamr will also vary from teacher to teacher. There are, there are certain rules for doing Jamr, which I didn't have the time to get into, um, which are, uh, which, uh, and the rules of those vary from teacher to teacher. Some teachers will be more lenient in Jamr, and some teachers won't be. Uh, there's this concept of khilaf wajib versus khilaf ja'iz where certain qira'at have different options, different options uh, for certain uh, pronunciations and usul, uh, whether or not it's required to go through all of those options or not. For example, the mad'arid lis-sukun, you have uh, the mad'arid lis-sukun is what would be considered khilaf ja'iz by the consensus of the Qurra, meaning you don't have to do all of those when reciting. So when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, you don't have to say all three lengths of Al Alameen. You can just suffice with one. But then some differences are wajib to recite. For example, the Mad Badal of Imam Warsh. Uh, um, this is a khilaf that is wajib. A teacher will require you to recite, even though uh, the concept of the lengths is the same. Some teachers, even to this day, will not allow you to learn all the qira'at at once. They'll only allow you to do jamr of certain qira'at um, from time to time. They'll allow you to do Abu Ja'far and Ibn Kathir together, and then they'll uh, allow you to do um, uh, Kisai and Hamza together or Kisai and Khalaf al Asha together. So uh, there are a lot of different teaching traditions. And finally, beyond the Shatubiyah and the Durra, so this is referring to the science of Qira'at, not Tajweed. Um, the science of Qira'at, beyond what we've covered today, the Shatubiyah and the Durra, they are what constitute Al Qira'at Al Ashar Al Sughra. As-sughra. And these are those, those uh, these ten qira'at and their ruwat uh, that are specifically from the Shatabiya and the Durra. Imam Ibn al Jaziri, in his books Tayyibat al Nashr and uh, An Nashr fil Qira'at al Ashr, he collects more turuq for each of these same ten uh, with more usul and more farsh. And that constitutes Al-Qira'at Al-Ashar Al-Kubra. So that is an even larger science. The main texts for those are, again, Tayyibat Al-Nashr and An-Nashr Fil-Qira'at Al-Ashar. Then beyond the Kubra are four additional Qira'at, Al-Qira'at Al-Shadha. They are part of the Shawad, but they are preserved from beginning to end. They are not nearly as authentic, um, but they are preserved from beginning to end uh, they are the Qira'at of Imam Hassan al-Basri, of Imam Yahya al-Yazidi, um, and uh, two others, Suleiman al-A'mash, and Allahumma salli wa sallam wa ala I'm forgetting the last one, um, but they, those are four additional uh, Qira'at.
Finally, uh, there are other related subjects that I mentioned that I touched upon earlier. The subject, the science of Rasm al Khat. Uh, so that is also a related science that one can specialize in. And the science of Adul um, Ay is also related. And obviously, the science of Tajweed is a related subject uh, which uh, one hopes to attain expertise in. That if anyone wants to do additional reading on the points that I mentioned, there is an article on Yaqeen Institute's website. Uh, there is an approach to the Quranic sciences by Mufti Taqi. Uh, there is an introduction to the sciences of the Quran by Sheikh Yasir Qadi. There is a variant readings of the Quran by Ahmed Ali Al Imam. And for a more uh, didact for more didactic books on teaching Qiraat and learning Qiraat textbooks, the books of Qari Salim. Ghaybi Hafizahullah from South Africa uh, are very useful. You can find the PDFs online. Uh, that is the end of my presentation. Ibn Muhaysin, yes, Jazakallah khairan. Ibn Muhaysin is the fourth uh, Shad Qari. That is the end of my presentation. Whatever I said that was correct is from Allah and whatever mistake I made anywhere I slipped up any place that I uh, might have accidentally said any inaccuracies uh, is from myself and Shaitan.